Uh, thanks. Thank you, Bill. And as Bill said, this will be quite different. Um, I hope I will uh, give you something to think about. When I was asked to talk here, I thought, well, I'll do the best I can, but I didn't know what I could add. So what I would like to talk to you about is, well, I work at Intel. You guys probably knew that already. Uh, what, from my perspective and what I know about what Intel may do, what chips will, will look like in, in the future and what the challenges for us and for you will be based on those chips. And I do try to focus on systems on a chip and the fabrics that will go with them. And I know your, um, the agenda has a much more uh, politically correct topic, but I like to call this fabrics why we love them all. And we, we also hate them at the same time. I'll try to get it going with a little bit of uh, uh, humor, I'll say, where comparing these things to uh, our transportation system. And the reason I want to do that is actually there are some things that are similar and some things that are not. And what, for folks like me, people are always for asking of the, for things in these terms. And sometimes I say that just doesn't make any sense. People tend to look at these things as, you know, what is a fabric? What is an interconnect? What is a, you know, a system? I don't care if it's InfiniBand or Ethernet or make up your favorite. You know, everyone says, hey, they just have to move bits around. Is it working? Oh. Uh, try to uh, project. Uh, all they have to do is move these bits around. How hard can it be? I'll give you an address. I, it could be a physical address. It could be an IP address. I don't care what it is. It should go somewhere. I mean, can that be so hard? And then people always, they love to say, well, it's just like our roads. I have cars. I have packets. I want to move them around. Um, this shouldn't be that hard. Just give me a lot of good highways and build them the way I want. I want, want to use them and everyone will be happy. So the other thing is that uh, these are things where people seem to be able to visualize what happens more than other parts of the system. So again, it's pretty simple. We have some switches. They have to arbitrate for them. They, they have a bunch of tables. Things are distributed. It's really nicely organized. You know, we can think about what things look like. We have wires. They look like roads. We have switches that look like intersections. We put them all together, and they look like these beautiful things that are real organized. Everyone knows how to get around. There's no problems at all. And sometimes it doesn't quite work out that way, and it ends up looking like this. And again, I've done this on and off for quite a few years. And then uh, sort of my uh, sort of a form of a quiz is, what is the most common sentence uttered by someone who's designing a fabric? Anyone want to guess? No one's brave enough to guess. They're too, too, uh, they're holding their breath. Pardon me? Can you say it in Oh, sure, sure. I, uh, this is the uh, public version of what they say. Stop helping me. So um, again, it, there is a lot of truth to this, where people want all sorts of different things in the fabric. And I hope you ask good questions at the end, really impactful ones, because I have definite opinions about all of these things, of what does make sense and what doesn't make sense in these. And uh, my last thing to set things up is um, fabrics are probably, one could argue, the most shared resource in a system that has things that want to communicate. And it's really hard to get this, at any instant in time, one central place that can decide what you want to do with that. And the reason, obviously, is call it what you want. Programs, applications, context threads, they really are not very good at sharing with each other. Packets aren't like cars. They can't back up. You can't just cruise along and get to a clog and say, oh, I'm going to back up and go around it. It doesn't really work very well that way. So these are all the reasons why comparing them to cars is a bad idea. Um, they don't mix well. You have big packets, little packets, high priority, low priority, ones that have a real-time aspect to them, ones that don't. So uh, sometimes big things get stuck behind little things, and the little things are maybe lots of them, but they really are not all that important at any given time. People love to ask me about fabric features, and um, the favorite one seems to be adaptive routing. It kind of went away a decade ago, and now it's back again. Uh, I, adaptive routing has its pros and cons, but the other thing is people think, oh, just give me lots and lots of resources. I'll route them any way they want. And then they forget, oh, but there are sometimes I want these things to be broken up and arrive in order. and. That's one thing that's a negative on adaptive routing. So I have mixed feelings on adaptive routing. I'll say that right from the front, in the front. Uh, balancing the resources is tough. Uh, again, it comes back to um, there's, it's really hard to get that one 
uh, place that's visible, has a, has the visibility across the system of what's going on. That's for traffic, that's for power management, that's for uh, lots of different issues. And then the last one is sometimes things that seem like a really good idea aren't. And this is my way of saying that uh, really you have to try these things. Uh, there aren't, nobody can really build simulators large enough that have new aspects of the system that range all the way from what compute resources are, call them cores, I don't care, call them network appliances, whatever they are, they can go down to what they're doing and then they're mixing up with other things. Those simulators really just do not work very well. So the other thing is be careful what you ask for and build it first. I'm going to get a little more serious now. People also, and Bill asked, well, what's going to happen in the future? Uh, will things continue to scale? Is, is Moore's Law going to die? And I could say, well, anything that has a negative exponent is asymptotic, asymptotically approaching zero, and it will stop someday. At least one would think it would. But actually, um, the guys that, the process, fab guys we have, and even outside of Intel, we're good for another, at least a decade, probably more than that. Things are still scaling pretty well. So you should assume you're going to get more and more transistors every few years from the processes. I know it's really hard to see, and you, it's probably a little too blurry, but uh, the left graph you've seen plenty of times. It's nothing new. The right graph is a little more interesting. The top one is number of transistors, and it is going up on a log scale fairly linearly, as in approximately every two to three years, you're getting twice as many transistors. But all the other ones are dropping off um, from uh, the frequency, from the number of, um, I'm sorry, the number of, I'm sorry, let me start over here. Things are all going down. The frequency is going down. Uh, the power is flattening out. The, uh, the one that's on the bottom is probably the most interesting, which is the number of cores. It's actually been a choice by mostly the hardware folks, hardware companies that are saying, I'm going to give you more transistors, but I am not going to give you any more performance per core, per compute unit. I'm just going to give you more of them. And the real reason for that is power. And um, it's pretty simple math. Uh, Moore's Law, you know, you get more transistors all the time. Denard scaling, a little less common, is that for about the same amount of area, your power is about the same. So what that says is that every two years, you get twice as many transistors in a certain amount of area. Or another way to put it is, since I'm sorry, uh, you get about every four years, when you get four times as much area, you get four times as much compute for the same amount of power. Well. What that also says is, if you just keep building things the same way over and over again, and you, you try to get more performance via parallelism, the power you're going to spend to get that work done goes up. And it isn't obvious purely from the transistors, but coming up I'll show you some of the challenges all of you will see as chips start to change or have started to change in this direction and the steps that, at least in my opinion, you'll have to take to be able to continue to get performance keep the cost down for all the things you want to build. Things to say, I'm going to make it easier to program and hide latencies so that you can write your programs in the sequential fashion you're used to and try to get as many of those things running in parallel as possible. What's going to change is compute's going to be inexpensive. I, can, I work at Intel and I shouldn't say that out loud, but I will. Compute is going to get cheap. You get as many transistors as you want. They're practically free. The memory is getting worse. Memory is not scaling down as well as logic is. So just look at whatever type of memory you want to use. Try to rate it in a dollars per gigabyte. It's not going down as fast as if you can do some form of rating uh, of compute per dollar. Uh, the cost is really shifting. It's not so much how many important chips you have, but how do they connect together? This is really the revenge of the mechanical engineers, the revenge of the packaging folks and those folks that, you know, they were in demand 10, 20 years ago. I admit there's some folks in this audience that I worked on the big supercomputers in the past and it was all about the hardware and get the software running on it. And the mechanical guys, 
then they had their great challenge to build their big systems. But now it's coming back that those are the things that are really going to be in demand in the future. Um, the key metrics, performance always, yes, cost always. But the one thing that's coming in there is the power that's new. And coming up, I'll show you why it's not very long before you will all have to think about what are you doing and not only how will it affect performance, but is it a good thing to do from a power perspective or not? And that's going to happen to all of us. And the real reason for it is we've run out of tricks we can play to get performance without spending a lot of power. And after the break, if someone's brave, I would love to talk about all the features we put into our microprocessors that have saved you, uh, program, make it easier to program and hidden latency, but they all cost power and they're all actually a net loss from a performance per watt perspective. So we're going to cycle back to, I'm going to give you lots of simple things. Uh, again, I'm not sure that latency is still something that people are willing to pay for. And if someone has examples that contradict that, I'd love to hear it. It's a really interesting one. Okay, good. Um, let me continue through this, but hopefully we'll come back because I'm going to talk about things related to that where people will pay more money or say, I will pay you 2% more to get a feature that reduces latency. So that would be great. Thank you. And uh, look me up. Uh, let's see. So uh, I'm going to try to give it a little bit of a software view now. Hopefully you all have, or not hopefully, I expect you've all seen this. Design the hardware. Throw it over the wall. You smart guys who understand software will figure out how to make it go fast. Yay, do it. Easy to do. It's uh, this nice, we love things sequentially. It's kind of the way things happen. It's a bad idea. It's not going to happen in the future. Maximize compute. I already talked about that. Always get the most you can out of that microprocessor. Don't worry about memory. The cost was interesting. It's certainly how many big components you had. And, uh, but from your perspective, really, it was how long does it take to get that code ready to go where you can start making some money off of it. It's really time to money. And I don't think that one has really changed much at all. Actually, it's been accelerated for you guys. Um, <clears throat> I think you cared a lot about the performance you could get, uh, of course, the cost, and coming back to the standards. What the users see, and is it valuable to you and the users so that the products are better, and each of you, whatever your company wants to do, can pr produce something that is probably shorter time to market so you can make some money. Uh, again, I keep saying, everybody pretty much ignored power, and you're going to have to stop doing that. Okay, now we're going forward. For you guys to get more and more performance, you're going to have to get more and more parallelism, which sounds great, but coordinating between regions of activity, I want to be generic as possible, is hard. It's a pain in the neck. That's the hard part. It's not trying to do things in parallel, but how do you get them coordinated so that they are working together or not stomping on each other? Um, the memory is changing. You guys, I haven't been here for all the talks, but non-volatile memory is coming along. You should be able to use that to your advantage, but I also expect there's still going to be DRAM in the system because it's pretty cheap. There'll be on-die memory used as ca caches or potentially scratch pads if you want more control over it in the future. Um, so in the past, um, you know, getting code to run wasn't as bad as in at least some market is today where you have to get your old code has to run and it has to run okay and the new code has to run better. And that's, well, I would expect that's pretty frustrating because you have to spend all the time validating the old code, which is there because your customers demand it, although you really don't make a whole lot of money out, out of that. It's kind of like a tax. have to pay it, but it's a tax. Um, I thought really hard about uh, what less key metrics are going forward, and I really didn't come up with anything. So let me move to the uh, forward and come back to that where... When I say software rules, I want to challenge you guys to take a much stronger role in how systems are designed going forward. But before we get there, back to systems on a chip. <coughs> a 
it's great to say, oh, things on diet don't matter. They're fast, they're little, these chips are great. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Here's what's happening going forward. This is a little bit hard to read. I tried to put the blue arrow that says, well, I don't know which way it is for you guys, the left axis, which is time, and then the other two arrows, which are color-coded, which is orange and green got goofed up, but anyway, which is how much energy it takes. And um, as you know, energy is energy per time is just power. So energy is a better way to measure power when you're doing incremental things. But um, <clears throat> the bandwidths, you can get lots and lots of bandwidth on a chip. That is not the problem. That's cheap. You get lots of wires. I will agree, people want to write uh, modular some form of system bearer log or some form of RTL register transfer logic and you want to go through all the stuff. The tools are not that great today, but they're definitely getting better. Ignore that stuff. You'll get tons of bandwidth on chip. The energy is going to get more and more problematic. And that purple, I'm sorry, not that uh, blue line for delay and the energy line in red, that's for if you just ran a wire across a chip. And it's an RC, not, it's simple. RC mean, meaning on this, it takes this shape because they both go up approximately linear with distance. And if you don't buffer that thing, that line, it gets slower and slower and slower. It's horrible. The other thing is the energy is pretty linear with distance, and it's a lot. I have a chart coming up that shows you the energy it takes to move bits around. And that's where I'm going to tell you you're going to have to focus on locality going forward. The other interesting thing is logic. This is just a switch and buffers and a arbiters and a little bit of flow control logic. Um, the green one, it's really small. As in, if you go just a few m millimeters on chip after that, the energy to push the data around is more than it takes to go through a switch. And then if you couple that to the top one, you, you say, uh, well, I have to buffer these wires anyway because the RC flattens out and it gets really, really slow the farther I go. And you conclude, well, switches on die, they don't hurt me at all. I should not be scared of those things. I should say, look, I don't care what you do on die as long as you make it energy efficient and say, every time I have a compute, give me a switch. On die, they're cheap. Any questions on that? Because I'm going to move to this scholastic nerd ball slide with a bunch of numbers. Stan. I love talking topologies. Uh, for those that didn't hear Stan's question, how cheap is a butterfly? And I assume you mean the network, not the thing that flits around. But uh, um, so there are there's kind of a trend going on for topologies. In the past, it used to be building a component was expensive, so people want, loved meshes or toruses or which are very similar. Low dimension switches. I can build one. I can put this one right next to my CPU or whatever is computing things, your packet processing engine. And then I can use that over and over and again and I can expand indefinitely. Then what happened was, and wait a minute, I can string these things together and I can build um, multi-dimensional uh, networks. I can build Butterflies. There's a bunch of different flavors. I won't go through all the names. I can build trees, which are sort of like butterflies, folded in half. It depends on what you want to do with them and how, how big it wants to scale. They actually have a lot of value because what a switch like that does is I can connect quite a few resources to it, and it can go somewhere. And those resources can share the bandwidth going out, which is a really nice feature because most traffic pattern is very bursty. The other trend are these dragonfly things where, things, networks, where you say, I have a certain amount of compute and I'm going to have a hierarchical group oriented where I'm going to send a certain amount of bandwidth to this set of neighbors and a certain amount of bandwidth to a bigger set of neighbors and a certain amount of bandwidth to a bigger set of neighbors, which minimizes the switches, but it prescribes where your bandwidth can go. So, to get back to your real question, how cheap is a butterfly? You want to, when you have a small number of, I'll just call them nodes if you don't mind, I don't, no definition for a node. 
You want them to be all connected to each other with direct wires and minimize the numbers, which is all every chance you get. But as you scale up to bigger and bigger numbers, you're going to want to have switches that can group that bandwidth together so they can share your bandwidth because you can't have an infinite number of ports going everywhere. You, you can't fit them. So from a generalization, giant networks, you need multiple level tree-like, butterfly-like things. Or a mix of that with the dragonflies, which is fully connected. And meshes make sense on die because you're going to buffer and you have Manhattan routing. And that's kind of the hierarchical summary I would suggest. Um, I work with you. I can show you a bunch of simulations that show that. But basically, it's a tough question. There's no easy answer. It depends on how big you want to build your system. Now, on die, uh, because you have XY routing and because switches are so cheap, you want to minimize distance for sh definitely minimize the distance you want to go, and you're going to end up with some 2D structure. And that's equally because that's how chips are made. You don't get to run wires on funny angles, and if you want to go somewhere and back again, you're going to lose. On die, it's going to remain mesh like things or rings. On die, it's going to remain real simple, X and Y. <coughs> Lots of numbers. It doesn't matter how accurate the numbers are. It doesn't matter if I picked floating point or, or uh, if I picked integer ops. Uh, what matters is probably that second column called picojoules. You don't care about what pico stands for or that's an energy. What matters is comparing the numbers and what you're wanting, wanting to do. So. You'll see logic. They're relatively inexpensive compared to some of the bigger numbers, like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the fifth one down, on die wire. I, again, I'm choosing to use big 8 byte words. If you want to use 4 byte words, cut everything in half. Uh, this is just energy. It's a big number just to move that 5 millimeters on a chip. Uh, the on chip memory isn't great, but it isn't terrible, but it will continue to scale pretty well. The DRAM, the, go the DRAM guys are actually doing really, really well on reducing power. Then you look at the bottom. Moving bits around on wires is actually a lot of energy that you need to use up. And at the bottom, there's the simple little um, uh, power. Power is just energy times whatever frequency plus leakage. Assume leakage is around 20%. Just whatever your power is on the chip, 20% of that is leakage, the rest is active power. That's a good way to look at it. Whoops, one more, there it is. The ones I circled, these are the big ones. So uh, back to how this really will affect you is, going forward, compute is cheap. Think up all the cool compute things you want to do. Start thinking about uh, fixed function devices and logic because they are more energy efficient and compared to something general purpose, which is great. You can do anything you want with it. If you know what you want to do, the temptation is huge to build some specialized specialization. And we're already seeing it all over the place. You guys will see them all the time. Um, trying to hurry up. I'm out of time pretty much is that, again, things are different here. And that electrical wires, they're going to be what cost you. So when you want to move bits around, Think about that and um, uh, uh, think about the specialization of, of uh, building blocks. I call fixed function, function devices. Trying to get towards the end, um, this is what I referred to earlier. Seriously, you guys need to really say, you're in charge, you drive the show, the software is what matters, the hardware these days, it's interesting, I love building it. Uh, Intel's still going to make it. Other companies are going to make still going to make it. But you guys are the ones who are going to say what people see is what the system will do. The value is what can that system do. And you need to be very aggressive and say, I want to do this, this, and this. And you figure out how to do this for me with very low energy, with low latency, if, if you can justify it back there. <laughs> and um, seriously, we can't go through, I'm going to design a whole bunch of junk and spend two years designing, I'm going to throw it over the wall, and then you're going to throw it out there in the system. Nobody's going to make any money that way. We're going to lose. 
And then lastly, um, standardization. I really thought about this one. I go, I don't know. Um, and my conclusion is standardization is valuable if it reduces your time to market, the time you can get a product out there, not just you but everyone else. Certainly it's useful and it's valuable if it reduces the cost. If it means the volume of something goes up, you know, economy of scale and the cost goes down, that's good. And it has to be independent of implementation. As soon as you start it making a specialization, somebody will have a win for a while, but it will fade. It just doesn't, it just can't last. So I'm going to wrap it up. I'm about out of time. I hope we can take a few questions. Um, I think you already know communication packets, they're not cars. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Moore's Law is actually going pretty well. Um, the way I look at it is it's good for at least a decade. I don't know what will happen after that. Uh, you, there will be more specialization, accelerators, fixed function logic. I bet right now for what each of you want to do can say, if I had this, I could do better. It's not going to be that hard to get that in the future. Um, you will care much more about things being local. You are going to care more about where things run and you're going to have to figure that out because it's going to burn energy and power, power, power is what's going to really kill you in the next decade. Well, I'm sorry. If you ignore it, it will kill you. Your, your cool little chips will melt. And then standardization, that's a tough one. Um, I think it's got to be valuable to more than just you. Otherwise, it just won't take. So I went a little bit over. Do I have time for just a few questions? Yeah. Fire away, please. I love hard questions. Paul. Um, you talked about butterflies versus dragonflies. And, and I'm looking at your bullet there, the software model and performance to locality based system management. Yeah. I look at the dragonfly, I think of it as at least a first primitive step in that direction. Because it automatically assumes that a certain number of your nodes are clustered into a group or whatever you choose to call it. And you spend more of your ultimate bisexual or available bandwidth within the group and you allocate less to communicating between groups. Do you see it the same way? Because you described it a little different. I mostly see it the same way. Did people hear Paul's question? He loves uh, dragonflies because it forces, it encourages a form of locality, which is correct. It does. Um, now, we kind of, I, sometimes I call that tapering, where most programs parallel programs at least, do understand that concept. You want to send things locally and they, therefore as you go farther, it, uh, the bandwidth between nodes tapers down. And dragonflies encourage that. But there still is, dragonflies, <coughs> you have a certain amount of bandwidth per your node and you really don't have switches. They're kind of, they're built into the nodes. The problem with that is if you want to get to a really large system, you don't have enough bandwidth to send everywhere you want to because you don't know where it's going to go. And you are forcing, you are forced into an amount of tapering that some programs won't want. So I do like the trend of dragonflies, but they, they have scaling limitations. People like to fight with me over all, with that all the time, and I welcome the fight. Well, I don't disagree that they do have limitations, but they do force a certain amount of tapering, that's true. But it is a step in the direction of forcing software to think about locality. It, it is, and I'd love to say I, I'm going to taper by 25% every time you go up a hierarchy, but the problem is that people don't like that. That's, that prescribing where you get to send things is unappealing and often. One more? I don't know your name. I, you said that a lot of the members will have uh, I'm curious, you probably meant that uh, there are not many customers who would demand even better what is the today, but not in general, that it doesn't matter, right? No, I... You probably meant, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, there is more uh, potential in uh, making parallelism in software right now than demanded for low levels. So, I'm... I'm glad you asked the question because I never meant to say it doesn't matter. So thank you for asking. I know it matters, but... There's so many times when I've talked about we really need to do this to th reduce the latency, but any feature costs money. And G 
generally reducing latency means making things simpler. And that means providing some form of less features. And when it comes down to it, to date, I would argue, people will say, no, give me more bandwidth and because I know how I can use the bandwidth. I'm not willing to give up something, pay for something to get lower latency. I hope that changes because it's always been frustrating for, for me, but to date, people have not been willing to say, I will give up something, I have a fixed cost, I will give up something to get lower latency for going primarily off chip. I think you're right. I, I just, I don't know what will be the uh, incentive, what will be the motivator to change it. But I think you are right. I just, I can't say when. I will be around. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me take a few questions.